Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. Praise God, amen. Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 7. And we'll just be reading through verse 15. Everybody knows the famous old Shakespearean quote, A Rose by Any Other Name. Well, that's the title of my message tonight, A Rose by Any Other Name. Amen. Matthew 10, 7 through 15. And the Word of God reads, And as ye go, this is Jesus speaking, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, <clears throat> freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays. For the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when ye depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust off, uh, of your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you for the wonderful presence of God we feel in this place. Lord, we just ask tonight that your anointing would reside upon your messenger. God, that you would help me to deliver this message that you've given me for this time, for this people, for those that might hear this tape, uh, by, uh, this message by tape, or they might hear it by the Internet. God, there are so many today that need to know that you're a powerful God who's able to do great things. Master, help us today to deliver this word faithfully uh, the way that you'd have us to deliver it, God, that it might inspire faith in the heart of the hearers. Master, today, to believe you for great things. For we ask it in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and honor forever. Amen. Praise God and amen. You can sit down if you will. You know, sometimes people will look toward the Bible and say, Oh, that book is outdated. It doesn't hold any significance for us today. But I want you to know that the truth of the matter is, sometimes the Word of God exposes great truths relative to issues and enemies which we face even in the here and now. Amen? Although it may do so using terms and names for conditions and situations which uh, may not even any longer effectively exist within our world. But even as Shakespeare so poignantly and eloquently stated so many years ago, a rose by any other name smells as sweet. Or as we so often hear it misquoted, a rose by any other name is still a rose. Amen. It doesn't matter what you call it, Brother Willie, it's the same thing a lot of times. A lot of times it's the same thing with a different faith. You see, when the Cold War ended, a lot of people in America thought that America no longer had enemies. We thought we could just rest on our laurels and be comfortable because nobody was interested any longer in destroying us and coming against us as a nation. But on September 11th, we found out that wasn't so. Amen. The enemy's got a different name. It's got a different faith. But we still got enemies. Amen. A rose by any other name. It's the same thing. It's just got new packaging today. Well, I want you to know there's a great truth in God's Word that's very relative to people in our day and time. Even though the names, the names may be slightly different, the truth is relevant for one and all. It's relevant for you and I in this day and in this time. So it is with the now almost existent plague of leprosy. At one time, leprosy was all over the world, and people everywhere were plagued by this horrible condition that caused them to become outsiders and outcasts 
and they weren't even able to dwell oftentimes amongst their own family and in the company of their own community. But today, of course, leprosy is virtually unheard of. Le leprosy may very well have been effectively wiped off the face of the globe. Now, I do understand there are still a few uh, scattered areas in the world where leprosy still exists, but for the most part, it's virtually been wiped off the face of the planet, alongside of such great plagues as chickenpox, which once killed people by the hundreds of thousands, destroying entire populations and emptying entire townships of their citizenry. So it is in our world today, while we no longer have such uh, great diseases as chickenpox and leprosy, we do have great plagues which continue to terrorize the bulk of humanity. If nothing else tonight can be called the leprosy of the year 2000, if nothing else can be called the leprosy of the 21st century, my friends, I'm certain that many of us would agree that HIV and AIDS most certainly qualify as the leprosy of our time. Am I telling the truth tonight? Amen. HIV and AIDS, this plague can be likened in so many ways uh, to the leprous plague. But I want you to be encouraged tonight, children. I want you to see how our Lord dealt with such issues during his earthly ministry. In Matthew 11, 1 through 6, the Word of God tells us, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Children, I want you to know this same Jesus who was able to heal the leper 2,000 years ago is still able to heal the leper today. What he was able to do for the leper during his earthly ministry, he is able to do much more, much greater today because he's working by the Spirit through his people. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 17, 11 through 19, And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem, again speaking of Jesus, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, there met with him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. Hallelujah. I want you to know this St. Jesus, who was able to speak direction to these lepers that brought them a miracle and brought them a supernatural act of God, is able today to speak to your soul direction so that you can know what place you need to be in and where you need to go and what you need to be doing so that you can have divine health, so that you can have a miracle in your life, so that God can confound the doctors and confuse the scientists by doing what they're not capable of doing today. Hallelujah. Oh, they may know how to roll back the effects of this thing, but my God is able to roll back the virus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Not only did my Jesus heal the leper, he's given his church a very distinct directive to do the same. Matthew 10, 7 and 8, part of our primary text that I read to you tonight, the Lord says, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Brother Willie, I'll tell you, the only thing that stops most churches from being able to minister to the lepers in our society today 
is a lack of compassion. Because when you do not have compassion, you do not have what it takes to unlock God's miracle power. Amen. Do you hear me now? If you can't believe God for miracles uh, for somebody, uh, you certainly aren't going to believe them when you don't like that person or you don't like the way they're living or you don't like who they are. I remember it'll be four years ago that I was in the hospital in Connecticut dying with pneumonia. And I remember my aunt, whom I had made my health care proxy, I gave her one directive. I said, if ever I'm dying and the doctors say it's, it's no good, it's all over, the only thing I ask of you is that you get an apostolic Jesus name preacher come anoint me with all they hands on me and pray for me. I said, if God don't heal me after that, then go ahead and pull the plug. But don't you do it until you've called for the man of God to come and pray for me. That's the only directive I have. Amen. Well, I want you to know, my aunt contacted a couple of preachers. She said the only preachers, uh, apostolic preachers I could find in the area are black. But... Uh, I called them and invited them and asked them if they would come. And, of course, then she proceeded to tell me she did a very stupid thing. Well, I told them all about you and who you are and what you do. And but, Oh, yeah, that was smart. So take a wild guess as to whether or not I saw any of those preachers, Brother Willie. Not that I recall. If they were there, they must have been there when I was really doped up because I don't remember them coming. There was a little Trinity preacher that I grew up with, Tom uh, Keith from Seymour, pastoring a little uh, four-square gospel church there in Seymour. And bless his little heart, I remember Tom Keith coming to see me several times and praying for me. But you see, Tom had known me since I was a kid. Tom and I had a relationship that went back 25 or 30 years. So he was still able to look at me with compassion. He was still able to look at me through the eyes of love. I'm going to tell you, church, there is a reason why God tells us, judge not least you be judged. There is a reason why God tells us, condemn not least you be condemned. There is a reason why God does not allow that behavior to be a part of our conduct. And that is because the moment we enter into that kind of a mindset and that kind of behavior, we cut ourselves off from the compassion of God. And we're not able to minister to people like we're supposed to minister to people. It shouldn't matter to you where they're coming from. It shouldn't matter to you where they've been. It shouldn't matter to you who they lie down with. Honey, if they're sick, you should be able to minister healing. If they need deliverance, you should be able to minister deliverance. These fools that run around judging and condemning and criticizing people, and in the process, they separate themselves from God's love line. Because compassion is nothing more than love in action. See, compassion never stands still. You can't have compassion and do nothing. That's an oxymoron. You can say, I love you, I care about you, I feel for you, I'm sorry for you. But honey, when you reach into your pocket and hand them $20 to go buy groceries, that is compassion. All the words in the world can fake the love of God, but you cannot fake compassion. And when God's people fall into this judgmental, critical mindset, where they're looking at people based upon who they are and where they've been and what they've done, rather than looking upon them as frail human beings in need of a divine move of God. When we begin to look at people with that critical spirit and that judgmental eye, we cut ourselves off from God's love line, and we're no, able, we're no longer able to even claim to represent the love of God. Amen. And we're no longer able to operate within God's compassion. And if you read in 
1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'll find that the entire chapter is devoted. We talk about love. We read it and we talk about love, but really, if you look very carefully, you'll find that what Paul is really talking about is love in action, which is compassion. That if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I have hair piled on my head till it reaches the ceiling, if I can shout in church until the windows crack, if I can dance down the aisle till the uh, carpeting is worn out, but I haven't got the compassion of Almighty God in me, then I'm nothing more than a giant horn that's sounding an uncertain sound. Brother Billy, I hope to God our church is always able to minister to everybody all the time. Amen. I hope that every single time somebody comes into our fellowship who needs something from God, that we'll be too busy looking at the need <laughs> and too busy looking at what we can do as people of God and people of faith to even begin to worry about who they are or what they've done or who they might have been in bed with last night. Amen. Troubles me that the church acts the way it does toward people with HIV and AIDS. Cracks me up how there are some churches that will actually try to offer comforting ministries. They try to offer, well, we'll help you with groceries. We'll help you with a place to live. We'll help you in this way or in that way. Help me nothing. Let's get healing on the line. Come on now. Get me into the altar and pray me through till God reaches down from heaven and touches this whole body of mine. You can believe from a person who smoked 50 years and brought lung cancer into their life. Why can't you believe for me? You can believe from the woman who slept around for 30 years and got gonorrhea. Why can't you believe for me? Jesus have mercy. Whew. Once you know, the Lord didn't say make the lepers comfortable. He said cleanse the lepers. He didn't say make sure they have food to eat or a place to live. Many churches today, and sadly many that preach the Pentecostal message, have assigned our modern leprosy to a place of hopelessness and despair. If they do anything at all to minister to the victims of this great plague, they only try to bring comfort, not at all obeying the Master's mandate, to bring healing and cleansing. Hallelujah. I want you to know that they, children, Jubilee plans to preach a message of hope and faith that will inspire men and women to believe God for miraculous things. Come on now. I'm going to encourage people, as long as there's breath in my body, to believe God to miraculously sustain them. There may be a virus in you, but I want you to know you and the Holy Ghost are in charge of where that virus goes and what it does and how much it can get away with. Do you hear me today now? I want you to know that the lights are not turned out in your life until you decide to surrender and yield to the angel of death. Glory to God. Whoa, hallelujah. I want you to know that you can believe God to miraculously sustain you, and you can also believe Him to supernaturally cleanse your blood of this unwelcome intruder. Whoa, glory to God. We will not attach judgment to our observations of people, because when we do, we cut off the extremely important line of compassion, which is essential to believe in God for any miracle. If you read the miracles of Jesus, when you read about him feeding the 5,000, when you read about all the great things he did, so many times you'll read it said, and he being moved with compassion. Come on now. What opened the door to the miracle was the compassion of Almighty God. Oh, church, if we're ever going to be able to minister miracles into the lives of people, we've got to keep the compassion lines open. Glory to God. We can't let the devil turn us into another church like every other church on the block. We've got to be able to stand those that most people can't stand. We've got to be able to love those that most people can't love. We've got to be able to embrace those that most people step to the other side of the street to avoid. 
because we don't ever want to cut off the compassion of God from flowing through us and ministering through us. Amen. I want you to know today, when people look upon you as though you earned or you deserve the so-called judgment of God that your leprosy represents to them, then they are no longer able to exercise their compassion and believe God for miraculous things on your behalf. Do you hear me? Amen. When people are able to look at you as though you earned it, or as though you deserve it, or as though it's the judgment of God on your life. When the minute somebody assumes one of those attitudes, Brother Joaquin, then they are no longer of any use to you. <laughs> Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. I want, you to, I want to show you what Jesus wants his church to be like. And he said unto them, meaning the Lord said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. But these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, they shall lay hands on the sick, they shall, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Glory to God. I'll tell you what, brother, it's all right that none of those stuck up uh, uh, heterosexual uh, black apostolic preachers wanted to come pray for me. Thank God there was a queer brother in Phoenix who did. Hallelujah. And he and his church got down and began to pray over a prayer cloth and sent it to me through the mail, express mail. And when I got it, I knew my miracle had done. I said, all right, the compassion line may have been blocked up over here, but the compassion line is open because this is my brother. Hallelujah. One day you'll understand why. It's so important that you be in a church like ours. Because if you ever have to go through a hospitalization like I went through, you're going to thank God Almighty every day that you're coming from a praying church that knows how to love you and knows how to believe God for a miracle for you. You're hearing what I'm saying now. I'm going to tell you, you'll be grateful one day. I had people in Connecticut at the time that loved me dearly and they appreciated my ministry. The one but a few of them. But they come to see me all the time in the hospital. And one brother, Jeff, come to the hospital one night and stood over my bed and prayed for me for hours on end. Just really had a burden for me that day. But that's because Jeff, was his, his faith line was not obstructed by judgment and condemnation and criticism. Amen. That's one of the reasons why it's a good thing when you can be honest about who you are and be honest about your situation and be honest with one another. And that's one of the good things. Because then we can find comfort one in another and know that you understand me and I understand you and we understand one another and that our compassion will never be obstructed by judgment and criticism. Amen. You hear me today. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Brother Willie, it don't matter any of those apostolic preachers didn't want to come. That's all right. Thank God. My little Jesus name friend down in Phoenix, Arizona knows how to pray. That's all right. I'll take it where I can get it. Amen. But it's better when you've got a local church that's full of people know how to pray. And when you're laying up in that hospital, you know you've got a church full of people praying you through. Amen. John chapter 14, 12 through 14, listen to what Jesus said. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go unto my Father, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Notice he didn't say, I'll go to the Father and ask him. He said, anything you ask in my name, I will do it. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Glory to God. All power is at my disposal. Hallelujah.
hallelujah. He doesn't have to go to a higher source if you ask him in his name, understanding the power and the glory and the revelation that's found in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know God said he'll move heaven and hell to bring you help. He'll move heaven and hell to bring you healing. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on thy son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, I want you to know, the Lord was never happy when his people were not operating in faith. Amen. Every time his disciples ever operated outside of the realms of faith, it disgusted him. It made him upset, and he wound up rebuking them, Brother Willie. I got news for you. I don't plan on hearing any rebukes from heaven for Jubilee. We're going to operate in the realms of faith. We're going to operate in the realms of the miraculous. We're going to operate in the realms of the supernatural and believe God to do what only God can do. Hallelujah. And the devil be damned if he don't like it. There were lots of people looking at me dying in that hospital four years ago, Brother Willie, and they said, see it's God's judgment. See, he's going to die at 35 years old. It's the judgment of God. Well, honey, what is your answer now? Now that God touched my body and I'm back up and I'm preaching this affirming message again, what is your answer now? What have you got to say now? I've been doing it for four years. Glory to God. Now what have you got to say? Those fools will say, well, the Lord give you a second chance to repent. Well, he and I worked this thing out, and he knows I ain't going to quit preaching when I'm preaching. He's not stupid. And when he healed me, honey, he didn't heal me so I could get out of preaching what I'm preaching. He healed me so I could keep preaching what I'm preaching. That's right. Hallelujah. Whoo, glory. I'd like to know what some of them folks have to say when the Holy Ghost from heaven. Because you know who gets all glory and who gets all honor for the miracle that brought me out of that hospital? I'm going to tell you, it's the Lord, honey. It's the name of Jesus, sweetheart. It's when Brother Ronnie sent me that prayer call, and I opened it up, and I knew that the compassion line was unclouded and unplugged, and it was flowing freely. And immediately, I said in my little head, because I couldn't talk, and I said, my miracle's coming now. Now's the time for my miracle. I said, Lord, let's do it. And it was just a day later or so that they came and removed the uh, in, uh, intubation from my throat and took all that mess out. And praise God, I never had to go back on it. I didn't need it again. I spent almost three weeks on it, Willie. They said that's longer than the average person is intubated. They said we don't intubate generally for more than two weeks before we go in with a tracheotomy. But when they wanted to put a tracheotomy in, my, my Aunt Leslie, who was my medical proxy, she said, Chuck, I didn't know what to say. They were talking about cutting a hole in your throat and putting the life support in in a more permanent kind of a way, and I didn't know what to say. She said, I sat there and I said, Lord, what would CJ say? What would CJ say? She said, all of a sudden, it's like you rushed into my body and spoke through me. She said, because I heard myself saying, let's wait and see what God does. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Let's wait and see what God does. And it wasn't even two days later that God indeed did something. Hallelujah. I want you to know, children, if you can muster the faith to believe God, God is there to help you. The Lord is there to heal you. The Lord is there to, li to deliver you. Glory to God. Whew, let me finish Matthew 17 here. <laughs> 14 through 21. 
And then brings the son, the son from lunatic. He said, I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples of Je to Jesus apart or on the side and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. That's the only answer. That's the only legitimate answer. Because of your unbelief. You notice the Lord didn't sugarcoat it. People hate it when the preacher talks plain. But you know what? Sometimes you need to hear it plain. Come on now. He said, because of your unbelief. That's why you couldn't do it. He said, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And this is what I want you to hear, children, today. And nothing, I said nothing, I'm talking HIV AIDS, nothing, I'm talking diabetes, nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Hallelujah. In Luke 137, the word of God declares, For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Hallelujah. HIV and AIDS may be the leprosy of our day, but honey, it is not beyond God's ability to move and to heal and to cure and to help. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Woo, glory. My Lord, have mercy. Well, I'm trying to preach tonight, aren't I? Amen. I'm trying real hard. We got a baptism here in a little while. Amen. We tonight are not in a compassionless church. You're not in a church that sets itself up as judge and jury. No, children, tonight you're in God's true church. A place where people don't judge but only seek to minister every good, positive, beneficial and healing benefit of faith and confidence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every good and positive thing that faith and confidence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ brings, that's what we want to minister to you. Amen. Amen. And if that means we've got to accept you idiosyncrasies and all, well then bless God, that's just what we're going to have to do. Amen. Amen. Because I refuse to pastor a church for people sitting around in judgment of one another and unable to love one another. And when treachery or difficulty or trying times come, we're not able to believe God for a miracle for one another because we're so busy sitting in judgment and so critical. Uh-uh. I'm not going to pastor a church like that. I've pastored plenty of them. We don't need any more. You hear me now? Amen. We don't need any more churches like that in the world. Amen. God bless you. Tonight I want you to know it may have a different name. Leprosy, it may not be called leprosy today, but the leprosy still exists in our era. And I want you to know even as Jesus Christ was able to address leprosy in his day, he's able to, to address it in ours. Amen. He's able to address it in ours. Would you stand up with me? We're going to be going to my house from here. So that Cody can be baptized tonight. Hallelujah. If you want to go with us, go with us. And we'll have food and stuff after the baptism, right immediately following. We've already got it in the oven at home. So we just thought it might be kind of better to do it this way. That way we can get out there before it's too dark and all that, you know. But amen. And if there's anybody else that has not yet obeyed the apostolic mandate to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, I want to encourage you, we can do it tonight, we can get your clothes, we can do whatever we need to do, but whatever you do, obey the word of the Lord. Amen. Don't be like Saul, like we said in our message this morning. Don't be like Saul, who would not obey the word of the Lord and found a curse because of it. Lost his place in the kingdom of David and in the kingdom of Israel 
because he simply would not yield to the word of the Lord. Don't be like Saul. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we love you so much. We thank you, God, for this service. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We're so grateful, God, that you are a God of love and compassion. Lord, that you look upon humanity and you recognize our frail condition. You realize that we're not but flesh and blood. You know that we're comprised of nothing more than dust. Human beings tend to look at one another and we think that we're so much more than we are. But God, when you look at us, you know exactly what we are. And when we're hurting and when we're sick and when we're troubled, Lord, you look upon us with great love and compassion. Because God, in your heart, you want your church to minister healing. You want your church to minister help. You want your church to minister deliverance. You want your church to minister, God, by the love and grace of God, every good and beneficial thing to people who are in need and people who are suffering. Master, today, make us the kind of church you want us to be. Help our compassion to ever remain intact, God, so that your love and your power can flow through us. Touch bodies in this place, we pray, Lord. Those who are struggling with illness, we're believing you, God, right now in the name of Jesus. We're believing you, God, to do miraculous things. For the glory of God, let good reports come back, God, of the great things that you've done. Because we're believing you, Lord, to do great and miraculous things. Nothing short of the supernatural. Because our God is a consuming fire. God, purge the blood, we pray. Purge the bloodstream right this moment with that consuming flame. In the name of Jesus, cleanse us and make us whole by your divine power. In the name of the Lord, in Jesus' precious name, Master, in Jesus' name, God, go with us as we're about to baptize our brother. Lord, let your spirit reside with us even at that place, even as it resides with us here. For we ask it, God, today, in the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. God bless you, and amen. Well, God bless you. You're dismissed to...